Hello and welcome back to Unpopular People. We believe that listening and learning from each other is key for personal development and success. Today in our interview, Olli Wilkes. Olli is a DJ originally from Adelaide in South Australia. He traveled the world and he has his pilot license. What he's doing with it now, you'll find out in this interview. The show notes about this episode you will find on our website www.unpopularpeople.com. Please don't forget to sign up for our newsletter to have the chance to win something from our shop every month, something new. And now have fun with this amazing interview with Olli. Hello, Oli. Hey, guys. How are you? Good. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thanks. Yeah. How are things down in South Australia at the moment? Yeah, not too bad. It's a sunny day, but it's very cold here. So about 14 degrees. Um, we always start our interview um, with the same question, just to give our listeners a brief idea of who you are and where you come from. Um, so our, the question we always ask is, where were you born and how did you grow up? Yeah, so I, I was born in uh, Adelaide and uh, I grew up in New Zealand and uh, when I was uh, almost 12, I moved back to Australia. And um, how did you feel when you were a child with moving in this age from one country to the other? Yeah, it's the, the moving process itself sucks. I used to hate it. So <laughs> <laughs> it's such an effort to move countries and unpacking and packing everything. But and, you know, moving to a new school and having to make new friends and, 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 and fit in and, and, uh, and, and having a different accent. I, it happened to me at least two or three times uh, where I had a where I spoke differently to all the other kids in class. So. Uh, that was difficult, but it was always fun to have a new adventure and and be somewhere different and and uh, enjoy uh, different countries and and uh, and what they had to offer. So that was great. And I was uh, talking with some people um, the other day about it, and now you saying something like, "Oh, I had a different accent at school, and it was a bit uh, difficult or interesting." So, um, how do you feel um, like about the? topic of bullying uh, in schools in Australia because I experienced um, bullying in Australia is such a big topic uh, way bigger than we have it like from from back in Germany we have it as well but not as big like did you experience anything like this when you were at school yeah well, obviously you know kids reactions when you say words differently you know you, you you do sort of have a little bit of a target on your back but really it probably comes down to the individual and And, you know, it never really affected me at all. And I liked being unique and, and different and sounding a bit different. I felt like it made me special. So, um, you know, I feel like there was uh, definitely a lot of bullying in, in both countries that I uh, lived in with other kids. Um, and uh, I think kids, uh, you know, wearing glasses or having a different haircut or something like that probably got singled out a little bit more. So... Do you have any recommendations um, for children or young people that coming from another country or that look different than the others um, that you said you felt you liked it to feel special or to be special that they can identify with this special being special? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, really, it's about embracing who you are and And uh, and also adapting to your new environment around you. So, you know, you don't want to forget where you come from, but also, you know, uh, fit in with where you are. Do you have any siblings? Yes, I have uh, four sisters. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I have three sisters I grew up with and one half sister. Okay. So, tell us a bit about your sisters. Uh, yeah, I, I grew up and, and uh, obviously... Um, grew up yeah with a lot of um girls around especially their friends and and i i really didn't like it actually when i grew up i found them kind of annoying 
Um, but now, uh, you know, I'm an adult and I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I love my sisters and it was really fun. And, you know, I always wanted a brother to kick the ball with and I was always outside and, and, and mucking around. I never spent any time inside. So I always wanted a brother for that, but that didn't happen. And, and, um, but now, yeah, I wouldn't have it any other way. I absolutely love my sisters. So shout out to them right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, what is your earliest childhood memory? What do you remember? I wanted to ask exactly the same question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't thought of that in a long time. But uh, let's. Anything My that comes up in your mind. Childhood memory. Yeah, what's coming to me when I'm thinking is. Uh, going to school in Australia. Uh, I, w I went to school for two years in Australia um, before we went back to New Zealand. And that's, that's my earliest memory of um, being at, at that school and, and the first teacher I had. I remember my mum turning up one day and And I thought I was in trouble and I remember I ran away and hid from my mom and, and uh, they all had to come and find me. And that, that's probably the most definitive childhood memory, earliest memory I had. I was about five. So, mm. um, so and as we know, um, you moved back to New Zealand. I think this is where Ben and you met. But what happened in between? Um, what did you do from living in or growing up uh, or was born you were born in australia then you moved to new zealand and like back and forth what what happened what did you do between that and meeting ben in new zealand <laughs> that's yeah i met ben um two or three years ago actually beginning of 2018 and uh yeah a lot happened in between that um um a lot so um but yeah we moved around a lot at, when i was a kid um because of my dad's job so uh he, and uh we got to see a few different places and um yeah yeah a lot happened i came back to adelaide i um got my pilot's license i finished school and got my pilot's license and then i i wanted to travel and and uh lost count of I, I went traveling in 2010 and, and pretty much went right up until COVID. And, and um, yeah, I traveled to about 50 countries in that time. Wow. And did what I had to do to get by. And so, okay, um, from the beginning, <laughs> pilot license. <laughs> why, why did you, why did you decide to uh, do your pilot license? Yeah, when I was finishing high school, um, the Air Force was uh, um, looking for kids uh, good with uh, maths and physics, which was something I enjoyed at school and, and I was fit and, and uh, you know, I thought about being a pilot in the Air Force and, and uh, you know, it was, it's a big commitment being a pilot in the Air Force. Uh, you have to sign a long uh, return of service um, and I wasn't ready to make that kind of commitment at that young age. So I thought about flying um you know uh, civilian flying um which is rewarding in a way and and it was good getting my license but um the choice to do it day in day out was different you know i'm just a recreational pilot and and my license isn't current right now um but when i get the time and money i'll, I'll certainly be back up in the sky that's for sure Cool. So um, you're definitely gonna plan this for the future. Is this something you you approach at the moment, or what is what is like what are you doing right now? Yeah. Uh, yeah right now. Um, yeah. I'm, uh, today I was working on my tax so <laughs> and <laughs> oh, that's, making uh, the most out of thrilling. my tax. All that really <laughs> fun stuff that everyone wants to hear about. And and uh, yeah, I've been working on my tax and and portfolio basically, and and also I'm, I'm a DJ. So. Um, I'm he uh, due to head up to Darwin pending restrictions um, in a couple of days. Okay, cool. So um, for a bunch of gigs. And um, so, so like when you when you said you're a DJ, um, uh, so when when did this start? And um, like, um, do you produce your own tracks as well? And so um, when when did you when did you say like, oh, okay, I'm a DJ, I'm gonna go somewhere? How how did it all start? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, fake it before you make it, right? Um, but uh, I, I I went to Germany in 2011 and uh, just really in predominantly Hamburg, but also some time in Berlin and just fell in love with uh, electronic music and techno. And, and uh, I came back um, 
and worked a bit in Australia um, for a few months. The last time I really lived in Adelaide, and um, and I met a guy there who um, was in his thirties that um, that uh, yeah met an Adelaide girl, and he was a DJ all over the world, and he he took me under the, under his wing and and gave me his equipment, and I learnt, and then. After that, I left Adelaide and started telling everyone I was a DJ. I went to New Zealand first and played gigs there. And then I went up to, that was 2013. And then I went to uh, Germany in 2013 as well and played gigs there. And after that, I, I went to Melbourne beginning of 2014. And it just really took off from there. I've got two questions. Um, first, what's the name of this guy? And my second one, was it a mentor for you? And what did you learn from him? Yeah. Uh, so his name was Nathan. And uh, he, yeah, he just taught me, you know, he just taught me how to mix tracks and, and what my style would be. You know, he had all types of music. And I just, uh, I he told me, um what that genre was at first it was like a minimal sort of techno sound and i was like well that's my sound and you know i went on beatport and started discovering it more and and uh he taught me you know how to key my tracks and and what to how to read a crowd and and um you know assess the situation and do your best in that moment and where did you meet him yeah he's a legend i've lost contact with him actually so if you're oh. here he's, he's not on facebook anymore and, oh, and really? uh, i lost his number years ago so Uh, yeah, I do think of him from time to time, definitely. And, and uh, yeah, I'd love to be in contact with him again. Yeah. So, Nathan, when you hear this, um, you can be proud uh, of Oli, what you <laughs> yeah. taught him. <gasps> yeah, so you just said um, how to read the crowd. Yes. How do you read the crowd? Yeah, uh, you know, I, yeah, no one's ever asked me that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, really, it depends on when you're playing, but uh, I don't like to, you know, if I'm DJing later, I don't like to go to the club too early and see what other DJs are doing because if it's different to me, I just feel like it's not going to work and overthink it. So, but if I'm opening and playing the whole night, um, which that's how it was when I started, um, I certainly read the crowd by having um, the first hour and a half just a different different types of different things and what I want to do and and look at how they respond to when I do that. So the, uh, if I'm playing something uh, uh, light and I turn it heavy and, and it draws people in, you know, just basic things like that. You know, I can talk about DJing all day. I'm pretty obsessed with it. So. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're here for. You're, you're a DJ, you're on a podcast, so <laughs> we talk about DJing all day. So um, when you, when you um, do you produce your own tracks as well? Yeah, yeah, I've been producing, um, you know, for quite a while. And and when I started producing, you know, I I was the kid that never turned on as on the on a computer, and and I had to learn how to use a computer when I started DJing. I I didn't learn a musical instrument when I was a kid, so that put me back a little bit. And and uh, yeah, I didn't know anything about anything, so. I feel like it's taken me probably a little bit longer than the average person, but I'm certainly starting to develop a sound that I like. And and I uh, recently um, played my own track on a um, radio show and, and, and sharing the odd track on SoundCloud as well. So I'm really happy about that and just keep working towards that. And what did you find the hardest when you started um, producing music? <laughs> <laughs> yeah everything so <laughs> i just yeah from music theory to using a computer to understanding the software of ableton and and you know you always had those great little moments where you make a drum loop or something and and uh you, you you're impressed you made that and and it feels amazing so you keep going at it and then it's just a lot of hard work and not feeling the best about it and why am I wasting my time doing this? And those moments are becoming a lot less as the years go on. But the first three or four years, it was a lot of moments of, you know, I'm not getting anywhere and and this is all too hard. But then there would be that odd moment where I'm like, this is why I love this. And, and that really persevered through. And now those moments are definitely behind me. Mm -hmm. And what kind of learnings did you have? Um, so are there any recommendations for people that want to start um, DJing now? What learnings that you experienced could you give them on their way when starting with DJing? 
Yeah. Yeah, DJing is a tough one because um, when I started, you, you know, controllers weren't even around yet and and you just really had CDJs and, and that was it. So um, they weren't super expensive, but they probably were a little bit at the time. And, and now there's so many other options with controllers and obviously you had vinyl as well um, when I started, but that was more difficult and, and uh, CDJs was just the way I went with it. And, and that's what my mentor recommended and, and I followed that. So um, these days there's a lot more out there and, and I feel like, you know, when I'm pl- planning a gig, I spend so much more time um, on record box and, and uh, queuing up tracks and, and using software more than actually, you know, practicing mixing tunes. So because the equipment's easier to mix. So um, really, I just, uh, if someone asks me uh, if they want to get into DJing, I'll, um, you know, figure out how serious they are and and how much and and what they want to spend to get started as well because some equipment's really expensive and and certainly the equipment I I use is expensive so if they don't have as much budget I'll I'll recommend a cheaper controller and talk to them about keying their tracks and how to mix in key and and, and all that stuff And you said you played one of your own tracks in your mix the other day, um, which is a very good set that we will definitely link in the show notes. Um, uh, but I was wondering, so with this particular track, did you um, decide um, to work on this particular track until it's perfect in your point of view? Or did you uh, pick it out out of a hundred um, uh, unfinished tracks on your computer and just say like, okay, then you had a good day and you just finished this track? What's your approach to like producing and finalizing a, a piece of music? Yeah, yeah, good. I've never been asked that before, but I like it. Um, I, uh, I'm one of those people that when I start something, I have to finish it. And, and, uh, yeah, I don't play any sort of video game or anything because I'm always like, I have to finish this before I can do something else. And just recently I did a thousand piece puzzle and I was obsessed with it for four days. So, uh, so when I'm producing, I, I, yeah, I, you know, there's a point of the track where it's finished, you know, like I, I do go by the 80, 80% rule, you know, 80% is good enough. And, and I'm, I, I, you know, with producing, I think it's important not to be a perfectionist because you'll never get it right. And, and, uh, so I generally know when it's good enough and, you know, if, if, if it, I don't think it's the best track, I, I grab that track as a reference and I try and recreate it again and and uh, it never sounds how how it um you know how the how the one before is it sounds different but it's still the same same structure and and all that so this track I I um yeah a lot of my my production process has been just actually making a lot of tracks that I'm never going to play out and just getting into the uh, process of finishing tracks And this one, I was like, I'm going to write the best track I can. And, and I really worked on it for about three weeks. And it was probably, you know, 80% of where I wanted to be. And from my level, I was happy with it. And, and, and that was that. Yeah, cool. Now, there's, um, there's uh, the Music Production Podcast. Um, I don't know if you heard of it. Is, and they did, um, do every year the Jamu jamuary <laughs> where they uh, jam every day and they record something every day and this is just like a uh, interesting approach um, that um, uh, quantity is sometimes goes over quality when it comes to producing music so you just work on different tracks and try different things um, and because sometimes you uh, you try something that you you know like if you think oh i have to make this track perfect you probably would never have tried like this because you want you know like the gain is maybe a little bit too high and you know like all those things and uh, you you try different things so i was just um interested in how you approach this and so you said mm -hmm. when it's when it's done it's it's done but when do you decide like what's the point of like when do you feel like this track is done like when you listen to the whole thing and you think like oh there's nothing i can change or i should change anymore so what's what's the decision yeah no i yeah for me i just i just get over the track you know like i i tend to to get get to it and and i re-listen to it probably two times make some changes um and uh you know I, i i just listen to it with my ears um in different um different speakers and stuff make some notes um go back and make changes 
do it again, but I only do that two or three times. And then, um, you know, when I had this track that I put in the radio mix, um, there were some changes, uh, you know, in it that I would make, but I was like, I spent enough time on it and I'm just leaving it how it is. And, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't put it on a label, but I was like, I can fit it into uh, me just playing out in the live set or, or in a radio mix. So, yeah. We're taking a quick break and be right back into the show. As Oli has a big network in his music scene, we have a network on our Discord server too. Just sign up to our newsletter and get invited. You can sign up for our newsletter on www.unpopularpeople.com and be part of the Unpopular People community. And now back to the show. Do you show your unpublished uh, tracks to anyone or do you, do you have someone listen to it before you play it anywhere? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, got some close friends um, that, that we share tracks with and, and uh, yeah, especially my friend Matt. So he gives me great advice. Shout out to Matt. So <laughs> he, he's uh, about my level and we've been producing for about the same amount of time and we're just both obsessed with Ableton and, and uh, yeah, he, he always gives me really solid feedback and, and, and we've worked on tracks together as well. So, um, yeah, Matt's definitely um, not number one and and uh yeah i've, I've uh, you know i've got other people that i've done music production lessons with that um that i've paid for that have given me advice on um on tracks as well um and you said you uh, got a gig in darwin hopefully coming up um yes uh, depending yeah. on on the strange COVID rules um so um what is um so how do you how do you get your gigs like uh, How do you like? How do you find gigs in Darwin? Or you also told me because we know each other for a little bit longer. You told me that you played in Bolivia and in other places around the world. So, <laughs> or you <laughs> earlier yeah, said yeah, you, yeah. you had a gig in um, in Germany. So, how, how do you how do you get those gigs? Yeah. So obviously. Um, it That, that stems from traveling a lot. So I know people all over the place and, um, you know, it's the old fashioned networking and talking to people rather than, you know, someone hearing you set online and saying they want you to, um, you know, play for their, in their town. And, and, um, yeah, in, so the gigs in Bolivia were related from, um, friends in Germany that, uh, were making parties in Bolivia and, um, I went and played there and, you know, I turned up there and told people I was a DJ, I was playing where I was. And then that turned into gigs in other places and, and, um, yeah, really it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a snowball. Once you get that little bit of momentum happening, um, it all seems to fall into place. Mm -hmm. And what's your next goal? <laughs> yeah, uh, again, I haven't thought of that. I, oh, no, I do have, um, you know, things I wanted to do by the end of the year. Um, probably, yeah, they're not super exciting for, for lots of people, but um, but they're, they're good for me. And, and uh, as far as goals um, uh, with me, really, it's about um, wanting to just work really hard and, and getting the opportunity to achieve them. And you lately got into investment a little bit as well. Um, so yeah. uh, so that's, I think, also why you did your tech, so why you're doing your tax at the moment. So um, <laughs> yeah. what, what advice could you give to someone that um, in a legal way comes to, uh, let's say, 20,000 Australian dollars? Um, what should they do with this money? Yeah, well, I yeah, I've read some books uh, about investing, and and uh, yeah, with twenty thousand dollars, I'd I'd spread that out. You know, diversification is the most important thing when it comes to investing. So rather than put just twenty thousand dollars in property, um, you know, uh, I would spread that out between um, commodities, gold, silver, Bitcoin, and then index funds. Um, build an index fund portfolio and and that's just an exchange traded fund so whatever whatever return you get um whatever a country grows on their stock exchange is the return you get so um yeah th those are really good i really recommend them and you said you read some books can you tell us the books the name of the books so our listeners can have the chance to read yeah. them as well <laughs> So the book I read was um called Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins and that's that's like a, a huge book, 700 pages and 
just really runs through what not to do and and the psychology behind investing and not panic sell and and um, have patience and and um, he interviewed uh, the top. 50 billionaires um, around the world that are self-made and and has the tra- transcript in there, their recommendations from people like Carl Icahn and and uh, Warren Buffett and and um, John Bogle, who I also read his book, who started Vanguard, which is um, uh, the book on common sense of investing. And uh, he started the Vanguard, which is a trillion dollar company now and the first ever index fund. And he's really famous in the investing world, but not so famous um, outside of that. Hmm. And um, okay, so that uh, money masters the game. And so how did you learn like about commodities and uh, like gold and silver? And like, what's, is this all from this one book? Or like, where, how did you, how did you find out about uh, those different options when you diversify your investings? Yeah, so it started for me when uh, a few years ago, I had about $50,000 saved just when from working hard and, and, you know, I was living in Melbourne and, and in Melbourne that, that doesn't buy you anything as far as property. So I was like, well, interest, um, you know, from the bank is just less than inflation so that my money is becoming worthless and I can't afford property and, and um, I don't have that well-paying job to to sign up for that. So I was like, what do I do with my money? And, and I just started asking people and uh, that seemed to know what they were talking about money and grabbed a pen and paper. And, and you were one of those people, Ben. So I got some good advice from you and I know. Thank you. Patterns from <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not an expert by the way. I noticed a pattern of uh, what people talked about and index funds came up a lot and, and obviously Bitcoin and, and um, those sorts of things. And, you know, I wouldn't put all my savings into Bitcoin. Bitcoin, but certainly if you have some excess income and, and I would definitely do that. So your, your income um, comes from DJing, I think, at the moment and uh, from yeah. your investments, um, I hope. Mm. So um, uh, when, you, um, when you travel around a lot um, and you go to all these different parties, uh, can it be sometimes quite exhausting, like for your body and mind? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, when you're in your 20s and young, I, I, you have more energy. You know, I'm 33 now, so I definitely couldn't yeah, live so that you're, lifestyle you're anymore. Old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, 30. Yeah, so I like to, you know, get a good night's sleep now. But certainly, yeah, when you're in your 20s, um, you know, it's not as exhausting. And, and when you're going new and different places all the time, that that gets your excitement going, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, I worked hard in construction and warehousing in between, and I was just grateful that in Australia, you can make some quick money. And, you know, when you're um, in Asia or South America or Europe, and you, you know, you think of those hard mornings you did on the construction side and that, that, um, that, that makes you enjoy the experience all the more. Nice, yeah. And 50 countries, that's something really, really yeah. impressive. So, yeah, what is the uh, count at 50? So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how many it is. <laughs> you can look at your passport, maybe. Or do you still have the same yeah. passport? No, probably not. Like 10 <laughs> years, 10 years of traveling. So, um, so what is like, I mean, South America is pretty Im- impressive, I think. Oh, I, I know. <laughs> but um, what, do you, what do you think is, was the country that was stuck in your mind the most? In South America or anywhere? Yeah, or, or like in general, is there something like that pops up and you think like, oh man, this was oh, yeah, such easy. a place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always struggled with um, that someone, people have asked me that before and, and I always struggled uh, with that. Um, but when I went to Iceland, that was easily hands down my favorite country. It's just epic on every corner you turn, that place is insane and, and why, yeah, why? In, in, in which ways like in which explain it um yeah you'll just sit and watch a sunset and the sunset will change color seven different times it'll start off orange and turn to yellow and then pink and then blue and purple and the, yeah colors in between that and and you and that will happen in the space of half an hour and you get in your car and drive two minutes and get around the corner and see something completely different that's you know a glacier or 
a hot spring or something and you just the but you're sure, but you're sure you weren't on acid or anything during the time <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, the no, sky is so it. colorful <laughs> and blue and yellow <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 no no unfortunately not so i was uh yeah enjoying it or fortunately in that case so. <laughs> and how is it uh with the people in iceland um i heard it's like it's uh, because it's like s like a small population and everyone knows mm. each other everyone is kind of related i even heard there's an app to find out if if someone you're dating is like your second grade cousin or something so um how, how do you find uh, people in iceland yeah I've, i've heard that um about the app there so um yeah i love the people there they, they were the friendliest people because i just hitchhiked around the, the country and and um you know they really they go out of their way to help you and and it was it's the only place in the world where i thought i could just knock on any door and they'll welcome you in like a long lost cousin or a relative and and uh the people there yeah were just incredibly polite especially you know there's so many tourists there um but they're very sort of rich tourists that go there and they spend their time in uh in this little it's called the golden circle and it's um sort of these spots um near Reykjavik and as soon as you get out of that golden circle you you see a different different um part of the country not so many tourists at all and and you have it to yourself and and those spots are, are just as beautiful so um yeah that's where you can meet and connect with the locals and 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 get along with them nice yeah cool And, uh, Sorry, Elisa, you can ask a question now too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and imagine you couldn't live in Australia anymore. Would Iceland be your first choice to move to or which country would you go? Yeah, so I only spent a month there um, in August. So it was summertime there in Iceland. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a few. Um, and there's places that I haven't been to that I'd like to go um but yeah i you know i enjoy being in countries um you know in australia we have uh so much order here there's so many rules and you always got to follow the rules and and that's okay but i enjoy a bit of chaos so i like you know where, where you're responsible for yourself and uh you know if you cross the street and the green man's not green and you get hit by a car well that's your responsibility not not this the, the sign to tell you to walk so i enjoy the chaos so uh i i would uh, live in the country where it's a bit more organized chaos so you prefer a chaos country <laughs> okay yeah, yeah okay. exactly yeah south Thank america you. is where it's at for okay that, so. okay cool and in iceland <laughs> sorry i have so many questions about iceland i just stopped yeah. there once i never never left the airport so i, I don't really know <laughs> just no pictures and and it looks it looks awesome uh sometimes a bit um yeah like dull and empty but it's it's i think it's different when you when you're there and when you see like the waterfalls and the glaciers and whatnot you know mm. and so did you have any gigs over there did you play on a party no nah, no nah, no gigs uh in iceland just full tourist i was there i was 2015 so yeah i was playing gigs in germany at the time and and uh yeah went up for um a holiday to iceland and and yeah really enjoyed it Okay, and uh, the gigs in Germany, you, you got through your friends that you lived with uh, back in 2011, you went over there for the first time? Yeah, yeah. yeah I had a friend who, um, uh, so I met him in Hamburg in 2013 and, and he came out to Australia in 2014 when I was there and he moved to Melbourne and he went back to um He went back to Germany and, and uh, he was working at a nightclub and, and I went and lived with him at this nightclub in 2015 in Leipzig. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was good fun. He just told me about it and I said, man, I'm going to come. I'm coming. So, <laughs> sounds good to me. And, yeah. Nice. Um, what do you think, how did the current world situation change um, the music scene? So, um For example, at the moment we can't uh, travel through continents and how, in which direction is it going? So do you think everything will be more online continuing or do you have any idea what will come up in the future? What will be the next trend in the music scene? Yeah, the, yeah well, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I don't think um, anyone would be able to 
really predict what's happening. I just know it's pretty unpredictable and pretty uncertain. Um, certainly in the music scene, I imagine, you know, once things open up, um, people will want to go out and have a good time and maybe get a bit tired from that and rest up a little bit. But yeah, I just know that it's uh, uncertain and unpredictable and you just got to be in the moment and, and just, still may I, I you know for me i still make plans and 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 go for it doesn't matter what's happening and and right up until the last minute and and uh won't change uh, un, unless you know i'm told that that it's not going to happen rather than wait for things to get good i just think you have to get on with it and and uh yeah still make plans and if we get if it's yeah if we get stopped we get stopped Okay, so in, if you if you are responsible for your own action and you like uh, a bit of organized chaos, how how do you organize your own day? <laughs> Is it chaos, <laughs> morning till evening? <laughs> oh, that's so funny because uh, yeah, no, I have a schedule and I I keep to it and and I get really frustrated if I don't. No chaos, then <laughs> I, I thought you you love chaos. <laughs> I like yeah yeah true, but uh, yeah, my days yeah it's it, I don't know it's um. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one to explain, but yeah, my the way I I yeah structure my day is is pretty planned and and uh, and try and make the most of it. Just really about how I can enjoy the day the most I can with what I've got. Okay, so like, um, uh, how does it usually look like? Do you uh, wake up? Do you exercise and then go on the computer, start producing, or like, do you do you have certain days where you do certain things? Like, uh, I don't know, talk to the uh, uh, promoters and to like to the organizers of the events, and how how do you structure? um like your i mean that that all has to be like do you have yeah. someone that does it for you like all your appointments and all the gigs and or do you do it all yourself do you manage yourself yeah right now i'm doing it all myself and i can definitely see why someone you know has someone to help them with that but um yeah now it's not the time to get someone to help me yet and and um but definitely hope one day and Yeah, no, I, I've never explained my day to anyone, but uh, I I start off and I always have a cold shower first thing in the morning. And um, if I don't do that, I'm sort of filthy with myself. And I do a little bit of exercise and and uh, I, I have a morning routine to 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 get me into it. And and it took me, you know, it's taken me years to be able to sit down and just work hard from the first moment, I feel like I had to condition myself to do that because I probably had undiagnosed ADD. So I just would procrastinate or put things off. But these days I generally, yeah, I have my morning routine. I do that. And then first thing I do is really what I find will use the most brain power. And I do that for about three hours. Um, uh, what's, and then I'll stop and have a break and then I'll do those sorts of making those calls or, doing that sort of catch up stuff and, and, um, and doing those things that, that are important, but don't take as much brain power. Cool. Nice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It's getting dark over there in South Australia, like it's <laughs> yeah. getting dark and darker. Like the only thing we see at the moment is yeah. our teeth. <laughs> they, they shine so bright. <laughs> That's good. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we probably come to our last couple of questions now. We had a long day as well. Um, so yeah, just for our listeners. So Oli and I, we know each other for a couple of years. We had some uh, very interesting experiences in a couple of places. He got me some gigs in, in Melbourne. Um, before which was very nice and I'm very grateful for this and um, you should definitely check out his music um, like his last set is really really nice I really loved like the, the one on Kiss FM you just it just played the other day it's, it was really really good and I really encourage our listeners we put it in the show notes and they should have a listen to this and maybe they can um, find out which of the tracks in there is yours because uh, I still couldn't find out which is a good sign you know because it, it just flows with the rest of the music um, so some of our last couple of questions um, I will ask one and you want probably the other one um, so the question we always ask our listeners in the end is what would you do differently if you were popular because we are unpopular people here what would you do differently <laughs> if you were 
popular like a f world famous dj like i, I don't want to say those names so tiesto and armin van buren or, or so. uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you they're making money so play, play hardcore ED, day, so. edm stuff and <laughs> yeah, yeah i'd sell out for sure um <laughs> uh well yeah i would um yeah i mean the basic thing i would do is have a manager definitely so um But I've, yeah, again, I've never thought of that, uh, what I'd do if I was popular. Um, um, I, I'd like to think I wouldn't, you know, I still want to have that ability to grow and do better every day and I'd, I'd still want to do that if I was popular. Nice. And if you would have the chance to teach um, children anything you have learned in your life so far, what would it be? Yeah, it's, I used to used to um, ask ask my grandparents, do they have any advice for me? So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, pass on what they what um, my grandparent granddad passed on to me, and uh, that was just to be patient but be persistent. It really suits to all this situation that's going on at the moment. I think it's really <laughs> suitable. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and also, um, I said Kiss FM already, but where can people find out more about you? Do you have like Facebook or Instagram, or do you on Tinder only, or what? Where can people find out about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, people, I'm not on Tinder, but uh, <laughs> um, I have been before, but not anymore. And and uh, I'm on um, Facebook, uh, Ollie Wilkes, O W -L, L I E W I L K E S. On Facebook, Instagram, SoundCloud, under all that same name. Phil free to ask me anything about what we spoke today uh any general financial advice i'm really happy to give that and obviously i'm not a financial advisor though and uh you can also uh look us up on the discord unpopular people uh on the community discord so do that reach out get in get in touch with me i'd be more than happy to 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 talk to you okay we add this to the show notes so thank you very much um again for your time uh, it's been good it's been uh, very nice to talk to you like uh we enjoy a, our occasional conversation uh, anyways but uh, it's been good to record you and also have you on the show you've been a um a yeah a long-term friend now and uh, it's just good to for uh, like to have for you to be part of our unpopular people community um we enjoy having you as a friend and uh, we are, we look forward but also to catch up as soon as we can in this crazy world we live in by now so um, I'm saying goodbye from my side yeah thank you from my side as well um, to all the listeners yeah check it out Ollie Wilkes it's really worth it <laughs> no <laughs> um, thank you for your time today Ollie and yeah keep going how you do it's it's awesome how you proceed and yeah that we can see how you develop in the direction you want to be so thank you oh thanks guys it's a tremendous honor to be on here and i'm really grateful okay and if you have any final words uh, for our listeners today now's the time for it Yeah, my final words. Um, yeah, again, I just, yeah, it's a great honor to be on here and um, thanks for having me and, and I really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to this inspiring interview with Ollie Wilkes. All information about this episode you find on our website www.unpopularpeople.com. You can also find the show notes about this episode there. 